So uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be uh, introducing these products to everyone here. Um, it's It's been a labor of love. We've been <laughs> working on this for, for quite some time and, and uh, I think everyone on our team is super excited about it. The new system is, is called the Defender 88 pH plus system, uh, a natural evolution in the history of manufacturing excellence. So as Zach mentioned, um, we've, been, we've been doing this for a couple of decades now. This is our, this is our 20th anniversary. Um, so we were established in 2001. Uh, all of our products are manufactured in Canada. We use a German engineered system uh, that's uh, designed for North American projects. Um, everything's NFRC and NAFS uh, uh, certified. Um, and uh, we hit a lot of different, different targets with, with various certifications and projects. Um, so when we talk about the history of manufacturing windows and doors for high performance projects, um, this is, as far as I know, the, our first involvement with a certified passive house. Um, it goes back to 2012. Uh, in, in Duluth, um, 0.47 ACH 50. I didn't get to work on this project personally, uh, but I have been much impressed by the architect's work all around. Um, amazing use of glass to create open spaces in complicated environments. So this year we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So we have only manufactured high performance window and door systems for two decades, uh, never compromising on performance, uh, regardless of market demands. Our next generation of high performance windows and doors is the Defender 88 pH plus, as I, as I mentioned, and it includes two fixed windows, including the first cold climate certified fixed window manufactured in North America, an operable window and a terrace door. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, why is that pertinent? A, a window is a system, not a random assembly of objects. Reliable performance doesn't just happen. It's the result of a rigorous pursuit of excellence that requires great input components, expertise in assembly, rigid quality control standards, and extensive testing. So the Defender 88 pH plus system they are pH certified windows and swing doors manufactured in Canada, um, covering uh, some of those same points. Um, and before we get into the technical details, we wanted to send out a big thank you to the team at Peel Passive House. Um, high fives to Melissa Furukawa and Andrew Peel. Um, we've been working with them since late last year to certify our new pH certified projects, uh, products, and it would have been very difficult <laughs> without their help. Um, durable hybrid frames. Um, they, they include uh, thick walled UPVC in the profile. Uh, the frames are very large. Um, they have uh, multi-chamber design and they are insulated and reinforced with structural EPS foam in frame and sash. Um, for the strength of the product, the reinforcement is BASF Ultra Durer. Uh, it's an innovative material made of 55% glass fibers with 45% PBT and PET. So it's, it's an extruded PBT fiberglass rather than a, a typical catalyzed or epoxy fiberglass. It gives it high structural properties, uh, amazing dimensional stability, a high melting point, uh, it's lightweight, um, it is recyclable and reusable, um, the product is uh, green, so it can actually, uh, so it can easily be sorted by recycling facilities. Um, let's chat a little bit about the importance of fusion welded frame and sash corners as shown in the image. So there's three ways to assemble corners, mullions and coupling joints using sealants, uh, screws and fusion welding. Uh, sealants deteriorate over time due to weather exposure, weather extremes, UV, and pollution. Eventually, like, they lose their ability to seal properly. Um, screws create holes in the system that are vulnerable to air and water leaks, and over time, due to thermal movements, uh, they can also become loose. Um, fusion welded corners are stronger than 
these mechanical joints. They don't wear out, they don't loosen. Um, they stay 100% air and water tight for decades. A properly fusion welded corner makes the material monolithic. There simply is no joint or seam. Um, in our IGUs, our standard is argon glass. It's also available with krypton, uh, krypton gas, but it, it has not yet been tested to NFRC. Uh, the super spacer premium we use is an excellent spacer system. Uh, it gives our windows edge values of 0 0.024 watts per meter Kelvin. Unfortunately, off the top of my head, I do not know the uh, imperial value for that. Um, hardware affects performance, air, water, sound, security, and durability. The long-term performance of the window relies on the hardware maintaining an effective seal. NAS. So these are a bunch of units uh, that are heading out for our NAS testing. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, Benet in the picture there, he's, he's actually about six feet tall. He's, he's not a, a tiny guy. So those are gigantic windows. Uh, the NAS North American Fenestration Specification Standard um, is a performance-based testing standard that harmonizes US and Canadian fenestration standards. Um, products are only compliant if they've been physically tested. Uh, tested products are then labeled with two labels, one permanent uh, etched in the glass and one removable label with performance data. Um, the four performance tests required by NAFs are air penetration resistance, both infiltration and exfiltration, um, uh, water penetration resistance. Uh, to give an idea of the water volume used in the test, it's five gallons per hour per square foot, which is about eight inches per hour of rainfall. Uh, Ida recently broke records for rainfall per hour, dropping between three and five inches in some areas. So NAFS asks for about double Ida volume. Uh, it also tests for forced entry resistance and structural wind load resistance. Um, there are some other required auxiliary tests, which are uh, force to latch, uh, maximum operating force, uh, deglazing, thermoplastic corner weld, sash leaf torsion, sash vertical deflection, hardware load, and life cycle. So this is showing a few highlights of the general performance uh, standards of the fixed windows, um, now that we know what NAS means for performance assurance. So we're huge fans of seeing this additional assurance of performance as it is not required by PHI uh, to do physical testing. Um, and it can be tested to different levels uh, in other jurisdictions like Europe. Um, so you can see air tightness of almost zero transmission. That's handy. Um, for water, everything we build is tested to the Canadian max 15 PSF. That's about 127 kilometers per hour or 79 miles per hour. Uh, design pressure is the wind loading. As as well as weights that it may need to bear. Uh, 60 PSF is about 250 kilometer per hour, 155 mile per hour uh, winds. And in real terms, that's over 3000 pounds of load before hitting the deflection limit. Um, commercially rated windows, the CW in the performance grade uh, means commercial window. Um, and that's an L over 175 deflection limit, which on, uh, the height of this window makes uh, about five eighths of an inch of deflection. Um, the UW is of course, based on the reference glazing, 0 0.70 watts or 0.12 BTU. Um, but you can see the frame values between the two systems are not too dissimilar. With higher performance glass, you'll see the UW for the PH Plus Pro get much closer to the UW on the PH plus XI, but it'll never quite get there, of course, and you would not get the same interior temperature at the weakest point. Um, this is the performance sheet for the operable window, 88 PH plus Pro. Uh, you may find it interesting to note that the air tightness on the operable window improves. It's uh, 0 0.02 liters per second per meter square in the fixed is now just zero. 
Um, similarly, the design pressure has raised to 70. That's 165 mile per hour wind. So 2,800 pounds of applied pressure uh, before deflection was reached. It's slightly less weight, but it's also less deflection. It's only 9 sixteenths. Um, with the reference glazing, uh, we see a UW of 0.77 or 0.135 BTU. Um, you'll use better performing glass than the reference. So I'll use uh, glass with a center of glass of U.55 watts or 0 0.10 BTU. On a four by four window, that would be 0.685 watts, 0.12 BTU. A four by four, four by five window would be 0.675 watts, also 0.12 BTU. And a five by five window would be 0.646 watts, which is 0.11 BTUs. So the values do shift uh, obviously quite a bit um, as those uh, glazing choices alter and the size changes. Um, in a high performance or passive house, uh, you will want to avoid small fixed windows. Frame to glass ratio is not ideal. There's unnecessary wall penetration. It doesn't offer ventilation for operable or any amount of useful natural light. On a fixed window, larger is better. Your price per square foot lowers as the overall size increases until you hit the maximum allowable size of glass. That's basically the structural limit. The pricing structure may also shift if you have very specialized glazing because the glass may be more expensive than the frame and labor. So the ratio can shift, but that's very rare. In general, the principle is bigger is better. Um, in this particular example, the price per square foot uh, is about three times higher in our smallest window versus our largest window. Um, so with operable windows, uh, to get the same total area as the large window, you would need nine of the small windows. So it costs more than double, increases the complexity of framing and detailing, increases your linear uh, frame edge and installation values by about three times. To get the same visible glass area, you would need about 33 of the small windows. So that's kind of insane. It's about 11 times the thermal bridging uh, and good luck finding a framing crew. Your flashing contractor will enjoy his new boat though. Um, in terms of size, there are some functional considerations with going too big as well. Aside from glass and structure, the hardware itself can have limitations. The hardware is designed uh, for the handles to go in the center of the sash on the latch side. As the window gets taller, this can put it out of reach, so you may need to shift it down. This increases the span between the handle and the farthest point of the hardware in the top corner of the hinge side. Very tall and wide sashes can be more difficult to operate because the weight and span involves adds friction. You have more locking points, the sash is being pulled down in the top corner, the hardware can bind up a bit, and it'll technically work but perhaps not comfortably. And for someone with mobility impairments or who's just very small, it really may not work at all. For buildings that are intended to stand for a very long time, like Passive House, the full range of potential occupants needs to be considered, not just the original owners. Um, this is of course more pertinent for multifamily. As a guy over six foot tall, I can easily handle a giant sash. My under five foot grandmother would have had trouble with the large sash. Uh, not, not that she really opened the windows a lot, but um, ventilation, uh, that arrow's in the wrong spot. It's supposed to be across the, the, the top of the window. Ventilation has some additional practical considerations. The tilt hardware has stay arms that, that hold the top of the window, and they have length thresholds. So generally, the wider a window, the longer the stay arm becomes. So you increase the depth of tilt with a wider sash. The, the deepest opening is across the top. Um, so wider the sash, the greater the area of opening, and the, obviously the higher the volume of air that can pass. Um, so if you're trying to really hit an optimal 
size for this operable sash, um, a four, four foot 10 by four foot 10 sash is the same as a four foot by six foot in both square foot and linear frame terms, has the exact same glass to frame ratio, but it would likely see an improved long-term durability and um, the handle stays lower, the span of the handle to the farthest locking point is shorter, the ventilation is increased. So that's really a much better design sweet spot overall. Um, steel reinforcement. We have retained steel in the doors and uh, why? We've been building high performance doors for two decades in some pretty unforgiving environments. Um, the prairies seem to be uniquely hard on windows and doors. Over the years, we figured out a few methods to deal with the additional stress on doors and steel reinforcement is a huge part of that. Um, doors are an interesting animal. There's a few things that make them different than a window. Uh, the size of the sash, the weight of the glass, how often they're used, how they're used, uh, the thresholds at the base and the level of exposure. Now, when I say level of exposure, I'm referring to the fact that um, doors go to the floor. Windows may go to the floor, um, but it's pretty unlikely that a door is gonna have the threshold above the floor level. So across the board, you know for sure, even if there's some sort of overhead coverage or something, the door is going to be farther away from that coverage in general than the windows are. Um, the steel allows us to continue building doors that will perform long term just as we have been for years. Obviously, there was a technical hurdle to overcome due to the thermal transmission of a huge block of steel, but we did manage that. It's partly because our doors already perform so well, so it's not like we were starting from scratch on this. This is the performance sheet for our 88 PH Plus Pro Terrace Door. The single door design pressure is 55. That's 235 kilometers per hour or 145 miles per hour. The double door DP is 45. That's 215 kilometers per hour or 135 miles per hour. With the reference glazing, we see a UW of 0 0.80 or 14 BTU. Uh, again, I'll give a couple of alternative sizes with a COG of 0.55 watts or 0.1 BTU. Uh, a 4x7 uh, would be a U 0.724 watts, 0.13 BTU. Our max size, which is 4 foot 3 by 8 foot 6, that's 0.687 watts or 0.12 BTU. Um, I, I think it's also worth noting that uh, all of our cool temperate products have an FRSI of 0.74. So even if the efficiency class doesn't seem that great, the lowest interior surface temperature is almost at the threshold to meet cold climate, uh, which is 0.75. So you're much more likely to be able to meet the comfort criteria with this window in a cold climate passive project. Um, the largest single in-swing door is about 51 by 102 and the largest single in-swing door with a 24 inch transom is uh, 51 and a half by 126. Um, the limitations per panel are consistent. So a double door is just two of the largest single doors. Um, I'd like to mention something as uh, basically just personal opinion here, but um, if we're trying to maximize efficiency in our project, a door opening allows for air movement when opened. Um, an entry door should be large enough to accomplish the goal of entry and exit without having much wasted space. Um, I see projects uh, every once in a while with 10 foot tall doors, five foot wide doors. Um, they undoubtedly look cool. They're super impressive, uh, but an eight foot tall door works for any but the 10 tallest people on earth and they still only have to duck a tiny bit. I, I, I think that's a reasonable concession. Um, we have a, a 
pretty good sized library of Flixo models for our components. We have lots of different components. Um, these are three examples. The first one is our C2FF. It's a foam filled coupler for the 88 pH plus XI fixed fixed combination. Um, you can see it's a 0.65 uh, uh, watts per meter squared Kelvin. Uh, model two, the M1FF, it's a structural foam filled mullion for the 88 pH plus XI fixed fixed combination at 0.64 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And model three is a C2FO. That's a foam filled coupler with a backer tube for 88 pH plus pro fixed operable combinations. Now we've been using backup tubes for years to improve the structure in high wind load applications. So we apply the same concept on these windows to avoid heavy structure in the coupling and mullions. Adding steel on the warm side of the window has a marginal impact on performance. Um, this is of course optional, uh, depending on your aesthetic purposes, the wind load, et cetera. Um, we have tons of center of glass simulations um, conducted by RDH Building Science. Uh, they calculated the, of course, U value, solar heat gain, uh, G value, and the visible transmittance uh, VT values for the simulated IGUs of our most common glazing combinations uh, for the 46 millimeter overall. IGU. Um, and this data is available to our clients. So there's a, a, a bunch of different options available for our products. We have a subframe adapter that simplifies sill attachments. Um, the steel reinforcements are optional. Um, we can build larger windows. We can build higher structure windows um, that perfectly match. Um, and they perform almost as well thermally. Um, we have three different handle positions with, with potential for variability depending on uh, project size. Um, the tilt limiter is exactly how it sounds. Um, you can set it to a position that limits the tilt so you can still naturally ventilate in winter at a reduced rate. Um, uh, there are a number of different hardware operation options. Um, tilt turn is standard, uh, but we can also do tilt before turn, tilt only. We have safety restrictors, uh, safety locks um, of a number of different types. Um, we have piles of glazing solutions, different glass thicknesses, different low E coatings, uh, laminated glass. Um, our standard uh, acoustical OITC is 28 decibels. Um, so that's a 444 combination. So it only grows from there. Um, there are exterior and interior color finishes, and uh, we actually have aluminum cladding options, um, which do look pretty, pretty nifty. Um, the exterior and interior foil color options are uh, laminated films. Uh, they're extremely durable. Uh, they're made from PMMA, uh, polymethyl methacrylate, which is um, plexiglass basically. So you have opaque plexiglass that's colored with a clear plexiglass surface on top of it. Um, many of them have uh, an, an acrylic layer on the bottom of it to uh, prevent heat buildup on top of the fact that the PMA, PMMA is naturally UV reflective. So um, they, they really do have amazing durability against uh, not just the color fade, but from transferring heat into the profile, um, which of course can cause, um, you know, thermal deformation and stuff like that. Um, it's uh, got pretty good scratch and chemical resistance. It's very easy to clean and you can have it on the interior and exterior. Um, we've got a bunch of different installation details. Um, this, this particular one is a timber frame installation for the uh, 88 pH plus XI um, that uh, in an Arctic situation with the over insulated sill, you're at uh, 0 0.008 watts per meter Kelvin, which is uh, no thermal bridging. It's, uh, um, we also have like deep stud wall, EFAS and, and other situations. Um, 
strap anchor installation. This photo is from the South Alberta Institute of Technology. Um, I think it's the first net zero commercial building in Alberta. Um, the benefits of strap anchors um, are uh, you actually get, you can get greater strength. Um, you have increased wind load resistance. Uh, you have long-term durability because it can uh, absorb building movement. Um, there's more installation flexibility. Um, you can easily pull it in or out, uh, place it anywhere you want in the wall cavity. Um, and uh, it's a simplified installation from the interior. So if you're doing uh, high-rise construction, you don't have to put the window in from the outside. Um, I imagine that everyone knows a fair bit about this project from, from the uh, excellent presentation a few weeks ago. Um, this is a project that we're involved in, um, uh, Cornerstone Architects, uh, being built by Edge Vancouver Construction Group. Um, RDH Building Science is the uh, certifier. Um, it's a very cool building and I can't wait to uh, see it finished. Sorry? Um, I think, think you can ignore that, Mike. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> There are a uh, couple of photos under construction here. So fairly typical site experience. Um, our windows and doors go in, they get taped or caulked, and that's, that's about it for a while since they're, they're basically weatherproof at that point. Um, this shot on the interior is the backup tube system. So it's conceptually the same as the curtain wall attachments that I've seen used on high rises. Um, it allows for building movement vertically while securing the product horizontally against wind load. Um, there's a matching UPVC cap that snaps on to finish it off visually uh, once the install is totally completed. Uh, the UBC Evolve project, um, so designed by ZGF Architects in Canada or ZGF in the US, um, the building has some really cool looking uh, custom solar shades mounted around the windows and um, it's great to see UBC stepping up and pushing forward with high standards on their student housing. Um, you know, the, the next generation of, or the, the current generation of students is, is going to know uh, pretty intimately what it means to live in a passive house. Um, these are just some more shots uh, from the project. So you can see the, uh, some of the windows and doors and uh, combination units uh, in the manufacturing uh, facility, as, as well as a whole pile of shots. Um, lots of tape on the plywood there, getting ready to, to throw some uh, barrier in front of it. Um, this project, the Roxborough Park in Hamilton, Ontario. It's, it's an interesting project uh, to me. Uh, it's the first passive house building that I've seen done like this. It's passive house level insulated precast concrete panels uh, with the windows installed in the factory. It's also a revitalization uh, project. This area in Hamilton uh, was a bit ghettoized. Um, and so they're working hard on a pretty significant neighborhood rebuild and uh, this is uh, basically phase one. This is, this is the start of that revitalization. Um, RDH Building Science uh, did a bunch of diagnostic testing um, at the Stubby's precast facility on two different installations to determine what was going to be the best method going forward. Uh, this was, uh, uh, they started the um, erection of the prefab walls in mid-July. So that's pretty much day one. And then August 31st. Um, so that's less than one week per floor for a completed passive house envelope uh, other than minor touch-ups. Um, it's pretty hard to argue with the results and uh, estimated completion is in October. So that is crazy fast. Um, so, uh, 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 again, with some names that uh, people are familiar with here, we've got Walsh Construction and PA Engineers uh, building the Parkview at Terwilliger Plaza in Portland. 
Um, it's an independent living seniors housing project for up to 250 residents. Can't wait to see it once the border opens up. Um, I'm always filled with a childlike glee when it when when I see buildings with bridges. I have no idea why. It's, it's just really cool. Um, beyond selecting the right window manufacturer, there are two things that impact a window or door's performance: uh, design and installation. So everyone here is well aware that window and door technologies have improved in the last 25 plus years. Um, these may not be mainstream, but high performance windows and doors do exist. And while the technology has improved, design and installation in many cases have been uh, slow to catch up. In this presentation, we're not going to dig into the installation. Um, if there is interest in it, uh, we'd love to do a dedicated presentation on installs, but I do want to talk about fenestration design. So I love this illustration here. It boils down the relationship between heat and air and how design can impact that. Um, a, a colleague of mine calls this the doghouse window. The only member of the house that benefits from fresh air is the dog or cat. Um, we all know that warm air rises, but what does that really mean? Uh, it means that warm air that is above an opening is unlikely to leave the building. If you open a window, you're actually more likely to let warm air in than out if it's low. In the case of an awning window, you can even amplify this effect. As the uh, exterior face of the building warms up from the sun, the warm air is rushing upwards and gets channeled inside the building. So it just fills up the top of the room. You're unlikely to find a less comfortable living space in the summer than the penthouse suite on a south or west facing facade with this window type. In spite of this, the doghouse window is one of the most common designs that we see on plants. So how do we optimize performance? Through the position and size of operable windows, keeping the design simple, and combining openings wherever possible. So here's some examples. Um, the original design, the operable window is small. It offers a small amount of ventilation. Uh, horizontal mullions interfere with the sight lines. Small glass panes decrease the overall performance. Mullions add cost. There's more cleaning and it complicates maintenance in the future if there's any kind of failure. The optimal design has larger windows offering better thermal performance vertical mullions to make the building look taller, fewer interrupted sight lines, and lots of natural ventilation. Um, the potential for air ingress is also less. This is something to keep in mind. Everywhere that you have a joint or seam, you have a potential for air movement. Um, window four has a joint from frame to glass, from sash to glass, and from frame to sash. This totals about 51 linear feet. Window one has this frame to sash seal, this sash to glass seal, and these frame to glass seals. They total 71 feet, and so that's about 40% more. Um, so looking at them in, in uh, the, the full terms going from window one to window four, we would save 25% on cost. We would reduce mullion bridging by 33%. We would increase sash bridging slightly, but also drastically increase the ventilation rate. We would reduce glazing edge by 40%. We would increase the glass area by almost 20% and eliminate the visual clutter for occupants, whether they're standing or sitting. Now, in this example, uh, we have operable windows at the bottom. We have poor ventilation. We have windows that are difficult to operate. You've pretty much got to bend down to the floor to crank open the window. We have operable windows that are very small. We have a horizontal mullion that uh, will interfere with seated sight lines. Uh, option two saves almost 25% uh, 
uh, option three is about the same. Um, the larger windows offer better thermal performance and the vertical mullion, of course, still makes the building look taller. The difference between option two and three in whether or not you would choose to use it is more than likely going to come down to building code uh, difficulties. Um, if, if we were in uh, Vancouver, for example, what we would probably do is push the horizontal mullion up to the specific guardrail height um, to prevent the need for restrictors and to eliminate the necessity for tempered glazing above the mullion. Uh, and then you would have just fixed tempered glazing on the bottom for safety purposes. Um, in some other jurisdictions, we would be able to get away with uh, a window uh, with the operable below. Uh, whether you would choose to go with restrictors and, and go with uh, tilt only ventilation, uh, but that would be a more ideal in an ADA situation because you need to try to keep that handle down below 48 inches. So depending on the project and the building code constraints uh, that you have are definitely going to push you in different directions and what may be the optimal design in terms of price and thermal performance may not actually be the optimal design for the project. So if everything is complicated. Fortunately. <laughs> um, now, this, this project, the King Edward Villa, in, uh, built in Vancouver in 2016, um, it was originally uh, designed with an aluminum window wall system. And it was originally going to be built to code standard. Um, even when a project isn't designed to meet high performance standards, by tweaking the design and using the right products, you can both decrease budget and significantly improve performance. Um, all you need is an open, curious, and creative design build team. Um, this, this building uh, met LEED Platinum, and it actually, uh, I, I believe that it achieved the energy targets for Passive House, but it did not meet the renewable targets because uh, they went with natural gas for everything. Um, but it's extremely low energy. Um, a 500 foot studio in there only costs about $60 per year to heat. So that's pretty close to free. Um, it's amazing. And, and it was delivered at a lower cost with those high performance uh, standards than the original code budget estimation. Um, these are some interiors of the King Edward Villa. They went with uh, pretty large openings uh, wherever they could. Um, this is a commercial window wall replica concept uh, with better performance and lower cost. Um, Paul Warwick, uh, who's involved in, in the Peak Project, um, designed this for us. So this concept here is if you have a building uh, that is intended to have a window wall or curtain wall system, there are ways to work around it. Um, to get a higher performing window in there. Um, so this is a punched opening uh, standard framed wall with exterior insulation wrapped by cladding. Um, and it's not that complicated to do um, and, and hits a, a really solid price point uh, that everybody would be happy with. And of course, because it's exterior insulated, uh, you can easily adjust the insulation level to match the project requirements. Uh, this project uh, photo is from the River West Apartments in Vancouver, Washington. Um, I think it's an important point to say that uh, it, it should help you to talk to the window manufacturer. Um, they should be the experts in their system, obviously, and they can help you clarify the product uh, and, and design for optimal efficiency, performance, and durability. Um, working together uh, as a team, you should be able to come up with something that works for everybody. So uh, thank you very much for, for sitting through me nattering away there for a while, and um, I look forward to a bunch of in-depth questions here.
Fantastic, Mike. That was really great presentation and lots of uh, questions here for you. I think that people have really enjoyed enjoyed what they've learned and have uh, more that they want to dive into with you. So mm -hmm. I just uh, I posted the queue for questions and and the first one up is Ben Larson. So Ben, can you uh, come on and and ask your question? Uh, my question had to do with uh, embodied carbon and uh, energy in these units for like, just give an average of a unit exiting the factory. Yeah, to, to be perfectly honest, I don't, uh, we don't have an LCA on, on the product. Um, the PVC profiles are manufactured in Germany uh, un, under their um, vinyl manufacturing regulations. So um, they, they have a closed system in, in Germany. Um, the, the hardware is also German manufactured. Um, the glass is manufactured just across the border um, in Washington and Oregon. So we try to do the best that we possibly can. Um, uh, of, of course, all of the products are uh, completely recyclable. Um, and uh, um, most of them actually do include uh, post-industrial waste because uh, there's you, you don't throw away PVC. Um, you recycle it. Uh, that's that's true across the board. Um, so uh, let me just chime in. Chime in here. There is actually an LCA available, but we haven't processed all the data and information yet. Um, so, as I mentioned, that's something that's work in progress. Uh, EPD and LCA have been done um, with the major suppliers in in Europe. Uh, so that's that's kind of work in progress, but exact numbers we don't we haven't dug into that yet so i'm expecting sometime next year we'll see some more detailed information and we'll be able to answer that question then <laughs> a little bit more precise than what we have now but we have to we have to dig into that information ourselves and see how that applies to our product and our manufacturing so the the whole the whole effort and 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 uh, by European Commission is to mandate uh, recyclable and reduce uh, CO two. Uh, so that's part. The whole supply chain is working on that to get that all down, and they have some aggressive targets that they're following in that. And so we're following that following that path that the Europeans are following. Excellent, George. Thanks. Great question, Ben. Okay, so moving on to Cameron Duncan. Cameron, I think you're still here. Let's make sure. Yep. So Cameron, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, you had a question about vacuum insulated units. And I'm happy to ask it for you if, if uh, I think I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so uh, Cameron's question is, is Inotech evaluating an opportunity to ut utilize uh, vacuum insulated units? Uh, yes, uh, I guess is the short answer. We've been looking at vacuum insulated glazing for a couple of years. We were actually using uh, vacuum glazing from uh, Guardian Industries before they uh, abruptly decided to stop manufacturing those units. Um, it's, it's a really interesting technology. Um, I, I obviously I like the uh, performance numbers um, and the long term durability of the units um, should be fantastic because it's it's a very well known technology the the um, uh, the glass soldering uh, technique is something that they've been using for for many, many decades. So um, I'm, I'm certainly excited about it, um, but there are some hiccups with actually introducing it properly in the North American markup, uh, market because the NFRC, uh, all of the products that we do have to be evaluated uh, by NFRC and they have uh, not yet finalized their certification uh, system for the 
vacuum insulated glazing. So we are not currently able to label the products, uh, which means uh, we can't sell them to you with the vacuum insulated glazing yet. Great, thank you, Mike. Okay, so next up is Robert Ha. Yes, hi, um, Mike. So this is probably a pretty short uh, question. I mean, it's a short question, probably a short answer now that we've heard the other. Um, my question was, are, are there any plans to manufacture your windows with uh, wood frames and wood sashes? No. Uh, I think you were muted, but it looked like you said no. Oh, that, that's correct. We, we do not have any plans to manufacture with wood. I see. That's just because it's more expedient to use vinyl and EPS? Well, there's, it actually is a little more complicated than that because uh, if, if you actually look at the overall concepts uh, of, of the long-term sustainability of the product, uh, PVC actually improves in structure when it's recycled. So as you use PVC and you run through multiple decades of use and then recycle it, remake a, a new window with the already existing PVC, you're adding uh, no, no energy or chemicals into the uh, manufacturing process uh, other than just heating it up to to extrusion temperature a couple hundred degrees um, so you basically just grind and, and re-extrude uh, the PVC and it comes through the process stronger you can keep doing that uh, basically ad nauseum you can get three four hundred years uh, of functional use out of the same base PVC product um, and so when the German government looked at it from the big picture perspective. They said, how do we, if we really want to reduce um, pollution and we want to reduce energy consumption, we need to be able to figure out how we can get products that are going to be used for the longest period of time and are also going to be available at a price point that makes it available to the broadest range of consumers. Um, so uh, PVC was the preferred solution, and that's where a great deal of the technology and investment has been uh, placed in, in Europe, and we're able to take advantage of that uh, technology and investment that they've been making for the last 30, 40 years. Um, okay, well, just, just, just to follow up then to that, do, do we, I mean, in BC, is there, are there agreements to recycle vinyl windows with, with the German process? I mean, do we ship old windows back to Germany? I mean, or will there be plans to do that? I mean, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Robert. Okay. So next up we have, uh oh, where's my list? Uh, William Spade. Yeah, I was asking for clarification on uh, delivery times these days for, for your product. And I have a follow up after you answer that. The delivery times at the moment are, are not at our ideal point. Uh, we, we usually shoot for something in the four to six week uh, lead time range. And uh, a combination of, of uh, the glass shortages that we had throughout the year, and then also just the sheer volume of, of uh, business that's out there right now, um, we've pretty much used up our manufacturing bandwidth for, for the rest of the year. Um, but uh, we'll be, we expect to see a return to normalcy. So even though we're technically in that, you know, 16 week range uh, right now, that's not going to be true in, in the new year. Okay, thanks. And one, one follow-up question. Can you clarify just one more time, the sourcing of your components, what's coming from Germany, what's coming from other locations? Yeah, so the uh, extruded, uh, profiles uh, are manufactured in Germany. The hardware it, itself is manufactured in Germany. So that's both the hardware components that go into the profile and, and the finished hardware, the, the handles. Um, and uh, the, the glass itself is, we use cardinal glass. So that comes from, uh, it's the flow glass manufacturing is in Washington state and the sealed unit manufacturing is in is in Hood River, um, but for the high performance units, uh, we actually use a local uh, glazing company to put them together. So they use Cardinal Glass, um, but they do higher performance uh, unit 
ceiling than what Cardinal does. Thank you. All right, thank you. So next up is Ted Barnett. Hey there. Um, I was looking at the Defender series of windows and I'm trying to you know, educate some of my future homeowners that we're building houses for. Um, and I was curious as far as not necessarily price point, but um, performance wise, is there a reason somebody would you know, elect to do the Defender 76 as opposed to the 88 Pro or the 88 uh, Xi or 11? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, the Defender 76 is is a, a very high performing product. In in uh, BC here, we have something called the step code. So there's five steps to go from base code to uh, basically passive house level performance. And the uh, it's slightly more relaxed than passive house. And most of the time, the Defender 76 will meet the requirements for step code five. It has the high air tightness that everybody's looking for. And still the, the thermal values are uh, uh, pretty good. They're within you know, 10, 15% of, of passive house certification. Um, so it's almost there. And the, obviously the fur, further south you go or the warmer the climate gets, then the more appropriate um, that performance level will, will be. Um, it is a lower price point product. Um, the, the profiles are a little bit narrower. There's, there's less uh, um, material volume uh, required in the product. We've also been manufacturing it significantly longer. So we've, the manufacturing has uh, uh, benefits from that experience. The longer you manufacture a particular product, the more uh, dialed in your, your manufacturing processes become. So, um, so there are some some savings there, um, and uh, and also the sheer volume of that product because it's the the main product line uh, that's used in Europe uh, by other window manufacturers um, from the same profile family. So um, so we get to benefit from a lot of other people using it around the world. Um, so you can hit very high performance levels. You can hit levels that are passive house and net zero. And, you know, if the designer is creative enough, uh, like that project in Minnesota, um, full passive house certification in a place is just unbelievably cold in the winter. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, it sucks in the winter there. <laughs> um, and, and yet the, the windows were perfectly acceptable um, with, that, with that steel reinforcement. Um, and you do get to save uh, a little bit. Obviously it is much easier to design with the 88 uh, PH plus system uh, being passive health certified, or if you're in a very cold region with the PH plus XI, um, because it's cold certified, then you really are not going to have to worry about your uh, um, you know, auxiliary heating or something to try to warm up the, uh, the base of the window uh, and, and, and uh, prevent your condensation. Awesome. Um, but as far as construction wise, anything you, you want to build with the 88, you can do with the 76 and vice versa. Uh, Dimensional wise. Yeah. Um, the 88, because it's a, a, a little bit more robust profile um, with the steel reinforcement in the 88, we can go larger than we could with the 76, but in the passive house certified 88, um, it's almost exactly the same uh, size limitations as the 76. Awesome. Thanks. I, I really appreciate that. No problem. Thanks, Ted. Okay, next up is Andrew Gregory. Andrew, I see you there. You just unmute. And if not, I'll ask the question for you. And this is one that got answered, but I think it'd be great to share with everybody. So Andrew's question was, what type of glazing reaches 0 0.55 watts per uh, uh, meter squared uh, KCOG? Um, that particular unit would be um, 
that one that was actually still uh, a unit that's over 0.5 g so it it would have to be a 180 180 i89 uh, unit um, to get that 0.55 uh, but but it is possible we uh, of course with the cold climate window the reference glazing is 0.52 so we have to be able to produce a 0.52 unit and that is a krypton filled uh, unit um, but uh, you know could, those are difficult numbers uh, to to hit to be perfectly honest mm -hmm. um, but they can be so awesome Awesome, cool. All right, so the next step is is Sasa, um, and uh, Sasa needed to uh, take off. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the question for them. Um, so does Inotech uh, produce sliders, multi slash multi sash operability, and what are the maximum sizes limitations for sliders? So maximum allowable structural size of the glass. That's the first question, and then there's a question then going into terrace doors. What's the terrace doors multi sash operability, maximum spans, limitations. Okay, for, for sliding doors, we do not have a Passico certified sliding door. We do have um, uh, obviously a lift and slide unit uh, with steel reinforcement. We also have a tilt glide unit um, that's uh, in the 76 series. So that's our steel reinforced 76 millimeter profile. Um, both of those products um, meet the comfort criteria for local projects in Vancouver region, um, but obviously that uh, may not be true for for all cl climate regions. Um, uh, but uh, the the tilt glide unit has very high air tightness. It's the basically the same hardware um, style where it's a it's a uh, four-sided compression seal um, so extremely high air tightness which makes it uh, fantastic for passive house projects and it maxes out at about 12 feet wide by eight feet high the lift slide product um, has a little bit lower air tightness still very reasonable for a passive house project um, as long as you're diligent with detail and uh, detailing and everything like that of course um, that one's uh, the it maxes out at about 21 and a half feet wide for a single operable so that's a an over 10 foot wide sliding panel on that one and uh, the height actually depends on the color and your climate so the the darker the color and the warmer the climate uh, will uh, will change the height slightly but uh, over eight feet most of the time it's it's around eight and a half feet um, but we certainly have done nine foot and, and possibly even taller. I'm not 100% sure. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, the next question is from Jim Madison, who is here but is having trouble with his connection. So he asked me to, to ask this question uh, for him. So how are you able to test your products for air tightness without testing in the physical? Software typically has limitations, and it has been my understanding from engineering team and others that blower door is the only way. You put it in a test kit, so um, uh, it's it's a, a calibrated uh, test facility. It's a closed uh, chamber that, that they actually determine the volume of air in and out. Exactly the same uh, concept as as a blower door test on a on a building, but it's it's applied to just the window itself uh, or window or door. Great, thank you. Okay, so next up is Kim Walton. Kim, I think you're here. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Um, so the question, I, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm if it, this has been explained more than once, but it sounds like the cold climate windows are for fixed units only. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, uh, the operable windows are going to take a little more development to, to get them entirely up up to that level of performance but what we most often find in in our designs it's actually the same frame uh used in the in the fixed window and the operable window and the vast majority of the windows that we build are have a significant fixed portion 
so it's basically a fixed window with an operable portion inside of it um so um you have one portion with with a uh, higher uh, thermal transmission rate where the actual operable is but the rest of it is still going to be that uh that that cold climate certified product okay that yeah sure okay um i do i have experience with innotech um windows and and honestly the doors and the um, windows steal so well there it's pretty awesome um one of the questions uh, the other question i have while i have the chance is to ask why you wouldn't why you wouldn't do awning windows for those of us that like awning windows is that even a possibility it, it's it's a, kind of a complicated answer at at the end of the day what it comes down to is that the the tilt turn is a drastically superior product in in a number of different ways um, our, our ability to achieve the air and water tightness, um, the thermal values that are uh, that that we achieve, the size limitations that we have uh, because of the hardware type, like all of all of the different factors sort of conspire to make the the tilt turn uh, preferable um, from sort of a, a, a functional perspective. And then on top of it as a manufacturer, because we specialize in the tilt turn window, that's what we focus our energy on. Um, and that, that focus shows in the product that comes out. Um, you know, we, we are specialists in tilt turn windows. Uh, okay. And uh, the reason I like awning windows two are twofold. One of them is I, I think that when they're low in the right spot, they are they really contribute to chimney venting in a real positive way. The other the other is that you can leave those things open when it's raining and not worry too much about about water getting into um, into the building, even with wind driven rain. Awning windows perform pretty well that way. So that's that's it for me. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I, I mean that that certainly does make sense. Although um, that is uh, also the the tilt turn actually does have pretty maybe not heavy wind driven rain, but but in in a lighter rain, um, they actually do have have pretty pretty decent protection from uh, from the elements. If I if I can just add a little note here on a tilt and turn system, you can protect the hardware. Uh, it's sitting on a on an interior okay. warm side of the of the system with a center seal gasket. So the whole uh, technological development of that is you can get better thermal performance values uh, than you would get an awning window. And if you place the awning window higher up in the room, you have to reach out. Like if you want, if the window is pushed out, you have to reach out and actually be able to close it. So for sure, there are people. I mean, I don't have a problem. I'm six foot four. Uh, I can reach them. But if you place them higher up and the windows push to the outside. You'll have anybody under six feet or five and a half or really hard time closing that window. So ADA requirements, and various other things, and thermal performance uh, will really make it hard to make an awning window perform the same way. Um, that's just a little technical side to it. Great, thanks, George. Okay, next up is William Sy Simonson. Hi, I'm a pharmacist, so excuse me if I don't use the right terminology, but we're designing a uh, passive house to be built in the forest, and we're very concerned about uh, fire safe issues. So I'm wondering, I've seen different, and I've talked to my architect about different ideas about how far in the window should be placed an eight inch wall. I noticed the strap hangers are an option. I don't think we've discussed that. And uh, what is the fire resistance if we have embers building up on the outside windowsill what are some of the issues there thanks well uh, from a thermal perspective the ideal placement of the window is to center the glass on the center of the uh, insulation value so if you're doing for example uh, just to make it really easy, if you've got eight inches of exterior insulation, the center of glass should be four inches 
out board of the wall to really take uh, the best advantage of of all of the thermal values and and get the um, the lowest amount of of uh, heat loss. Um, if if you do a heavily over insulated frame, you you can certainly bring that window in further and eliminate some of those uh, uh, the issues that you might see with with thermal bridging. But um, you know. In terms of fire, I, I don't know what what would improve um, the the result of the window based on on window placement. I'm 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 not an engineer who looks into that stuff, um, but the results of the window in fire testing um, are that there's functionally almost no difference uh, when a window is installed in a cladding system um, between windows, whether they're wood, vinyl, aluminum, um, they will all perform about the same in, in a fire. Um, uh, the, the biggest issue with it is probably going to be the glass itself. If, if the glass breaks out, the fire can go in or out of, of the opening. The actual frame itself is, is almost irrelevant um, to the movement of, of fire. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, uh, we have another question from Jim Madison. Uh, so Jim, Jim's question is, is steel reinforcement required because these are plastic and foam? Large wood sash with solid joinery can withstand greater torsion and UDL without steel. Thoughts? Sorry, could you repeat the, the yeah. first part? Is steel reinforcement required because these are plastic and foam? Hmm. Uh, in 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 the doors, yes, basically, um, the the movement of of PVC, um, although the steel reinforcement is still something that uh, adds to uh, some other materials that are that are more rigid, like fiberglass, um, and uh, there there is still a limitation to the uh, strength of wood. Um, but uh, yes, the, the, the steel in the doors uh, is, is there to counteract um, the, uh, the structural loss essentially that you get from the PVC. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Cool, thank you. So uh, William Spade, I think is no longer on the call. His question was about, um, about uh, frame types, which I think you've answered already. So uh, Blake, you had a couple of questions. And meanwhile, all this is the last, Blake is, is last on the queue right now. So if there, if you have any other questions, please uh, pose them in, in chat. And if not, we'll wrap it up after, after we're done here. So Blake. Uh, if you would like to go ahead and, and read those, that would be fine with me. Uh, okay, we've got it. We've got a few. So maybe I'll maybe I'll um, I'll, stick, I'll grab a couple here. So um, I think your first question was what happens with guardrail requirements on the first example. Uh, this is but you'd have to ex ex probably contextualize that for us. Also going to large window more expensive glass costs due to glass tempering. I agree optimal design may cho change due to code requirements. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a here. So here's a good question. Here's a, a, a more straightforward, um, I think, question here for you from you, Blake. Do your do you test your fusion welded corners? How pull pounds? The, the short answer is yes, we do. We do, of course, test our, our fusion corners um, in uh, a couple of different ways. There are a bunch of NAF, te NAF tests. Um, we, we test them uh, inside our facility as well. We do, we do a, a, a pressure test on the corners to, to determine the weld strength. Um, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what the, uh, what the Pascal rating is on that test. The, the Pascal rating will depend on the frame sash configuration, depending on which one, but usually it's anywhere between uh, 5,000 to 8,000 uh, Pascal. Um, 
force required to break a corner. The key is uh, on corner breakage is that the, that the break doesn't happen within the corner, but it starts in the corner and goes sideways, then you have a good weld. So that's part of the standard quality procedure at Inotech to test regularly on all the materials that are coming in so that we establish consistency in materials. Great, thank you. And then Blake had another one, um, let's see. Uh, do you offer more than a CW class, AW, LC? Uh, well, uh, LC is uh, uh, like a, a STEM. So um, the CW has the mandatory requirement for the uh, um, different the LOs are 175. The residential and light commercial classes do not have that deflection limitation. So um, because it's a more rigorous standard, typically you would say if somebody's asking for R or LC, um, obviously they're going to accept a, a CW in place of it because it's a, it's a higher standard. Um, some of our products do have LC. Um, uh, because they reach higher uh, water resistance ratings um, than, the, than the deflection limitation might allow for. So in, in some projects that don't require CW, we might say, okay, it's an LC70, but it's only a CW50, um, something like that. Um, but we do not currently have products with an AW rating. Uh, mainly because uh, the AW actually has a couple of very specific tests where they, they do something like uh, you, you take a sash, you remove the glass and, and you put weight just on, on the corner, on, on the flat. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not entirely sure what that test is supposed to show in terms of usage, but it's, it's a test that they do apply in the AW and we have not um, pass that test. We do pass everything else for AW. We, we meet all of the, the gateway thresholds and, and all of the uh, testing to, to hit architectural window uh, class. We just don't pass that particular uh, corner torsion test. So. Got it. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so next up is Steve Jacobs, and he has asked me to ask the question um, on his behalf. And the question is, what is the melting point for the CPVC frame material? George? Uh, about 250 degrees Celsius. Great. Oh, sorry, uh, melting point. Sorry, I heard multi point. I was like, oh, oh sorry. I'm not, I'm not enunciating <laughs> very well. Sorry about that, Mike. <laughs> All right, cool. So if, now, if this, if this is about fire fire uh, performance, the, the the key is uh, it does not contribute any fuel to the fire. Uh, so as soon as you remove any kind of fire source, it, it doesn't ignite anything. There is no no fuel uh, no fuel added to the fire. But for melting, it will melt quicker than uh, steel for sure. Thank you. Okay, so next up is Nitin Mehta. Nitin, are you available to ask, ask your question? Okay, I'll, I, I will ask it for you. Sometimes, sometimes unmuting is, is uh, Zoom makes it very difficult at times. So the question is, what are limitations and failure of the product that you have seen so far? Um, well, the, the, the limitations that we were initially facing, the biggest one was um, before we developed the new reinforcement system uh, with, the, with the PBT, um, it was the overall sizes and the color limitation. Um, the the new product well we it, overall with the with the products uh, we really don't see much in the way of failures it's uh, right right now the biggest difficulty is is manufacturing it fast enough for the demand good answer good answer 
I think the failures only show up if you don't stay within your uh, within your product limitations. Every product has limitations, and the tendency by a lot of um, designers and 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 window people is to overstep the limitations that natural physical limitations that products have. And when we do that, then we run into problems. So we we stick to the limitations that are provided to us by our suppliers for whatever their products uh, they give us. And then then we keep it to uh, keep failure to very little or no failures. Thanks, George. OK, it looks like we are to our last question, unless anybody has any others. And that is this question is from Dan Hargrave. Dan, do you want to ask it? Yeah, I was just curious if you have any pictures of your aluminum clad option coming up in 2022. Yes, I, I do. Um, I can't wait. find this uh, screen share thing here. Where did it go? Well, we're seeing, we're seeing, um, we're seeing a photo right now. Oh, uh, yeah. That's why I couldn't find the screen yeah, sharing. Yeah, I'm already sharing. <laughs> three part photo. Looks looks, yeah, it looks nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. That's uh, it's an extruded aluminum, uh, obviously, and um, yeah, we're pretty excited about it. It's uh, it's uh, kind of a new concept for us. Uh, they've been employing it in in Europe uh, in a, a few different products for a while, um, but uh, this is this is new for the eighty eight, and it's it's new to us. And yeah, looks awesome. It would be possible to clad the interior as well. Like if you're doing a front entry door, that would look pretty nice um, from the outside, for instance. Would that be matched on the inside as well? I don't know, Jim. No. Okay. Uh, no, that's not currently an option. Yeah. Uh, I hate hearing no. <laughs> <laughs> Still, it's a nice detail. <laughs> 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 all right great uh thanks dan so um ali zahurian uh has a question about washington state ali are you available to have, ans ask your question okay got it don't have a mic all right, so Ali's question is, is there any relaxing code in Washington State to use PVC and aluminum clad plus aluminum clad for high rise building? I can I can speak to that. There's really not not the limitations um, and, and to use it on high rise buildings. The only limitations that that we have are mostly just wind load and size limitations. So it's not a curtain wall system. It's not a window wall system where you want to go slab bypass or have a curtain wall where this system would not be able to use. So as long as you stay within the punched opening sizes, we have done 27 story high rise buildings in Seattle, retrofitted them, uh, or 25 story buildings in Portland. Um, so that's not a problem really in terms of uh, code limitations. Um, just need to stay within the sizes and design it to the required wind loads of a high rise building. Fantastic. Thanks, George. And Mary James. Mary. Hi, I just Hi. wanted to know if the aluminum clad would affect fire resistance at all. I I imagine that that it probably would from from the exterior, but it's it's not something that uh, um, is honestly that critical for us. What what's a bigger deal for fire resistance is is um, uh, from the interior, like the the fire leaving and spreading to another floor. Um, and there were a number of uh, uh, tests that were recently done by the Canadian government uh, looking into this. The uh, can't remember the name of it, the research Canadian National Research Council. Um, and uh, so in the testing that they did, they determined that it really doesn't matter what the window uh, makeup is. It, 
that that uh, the chance for the fire to spread from floor to floor doesn't really change based on the material uh, that makes up the window. So that was that was a research project actually where uh, many years ago we we commissioned a forensic fire for a forensic company to do a research for us and. And they did some forensic research when fire happens and they, they found out that typically um, like the steel reinforced vinyl windows behave uh, better in a fire under fire than aluminum windows. And that triggered a little bit of a research project for the for the National Research Council, which then also triggered a code change that's coming in, in Canada to the fire code allowing for vinyl windows to go into high rise buildings. Um, and the research that I did was a cladding research. It's called an S34 fire propagation test, where they put a whole cladding system, multi-story cladding system under fire. And, and what they found is that aluminum or vinyl doesn't really matter. Um, the only one that's uh, significantly contributes more uh, fuel to the fire is fiberglass. That needs fiberglass needs a treatment on the surface to prevent um, burning. So that's basically what they came up with. And so it's not really a big difference whether aluminum or vinyl. As long as you stay within the punched opening sizes for vinyl, you cannot do, again, curtain wall systems or window wall systems. Yeah, I was asking more from the point of view of wildfire resistance. Sorry, I should have made that clear. Mm -hmm. All righty. Um, thank you, Mary. So we have another question, and this is from Rohan Walters. Uh, Rohan, are you available to, to ask the question? Uh, I will go ahead and ask it for you, Rohan, unless, and, and you feel free to interrupt me if, you, if you're able to unmute. So Ro Rohan asks, what is the minimum order cost and or quantity for you to supply windows or doors? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we, I guess, realistically, it, it would depend on what region you're in. Um, you know, if, if, um, if it's really far away from us and it's only one unit, I mean, we'll still build it for you, but the shipping costs are going to be prohibitive. Um, so obviously, the larger the project, um, the the more the shipping cost would be deferred if it's if it's a long distance. Um, so we we have done uh, some some things where it's just a, a couple of units um, heading into the prairies. Um, generally, it makes a lot more sense to do a full house package. Um, so even if it's a small house, that's that's fine. Um, uh, shouldn't. Uh, I, I think it should all make sense um, fiscally, but uh, but just a single unit, you, <laughs> it's it's going to be a terrible per square foot cost. Uh, no no bones about that. Fantastic. Well, it looks like we just made it through all of the questions here, and judging from from uh, tonight's or today this morning's, what am I saying tonight? this morning's this afternoon's uh, component spotlight there is tremendous interest and demand uh, for, for for what you guys are offering uh, we had over 175 people uh, at one point and now 93 people have stayed through for an hour and a half so there's great interest in in what you're, you're doing and fantastic presentation mike thank you mike george and jim for all the information that you shared with all of us and thank you to InnoTech windows and doors and uh Everyone have a great week and uh, be safe. Talk soon. Mm -hmm.